I wonder if I could make a start by, by giving you a task. And you needn't really worry too much about this because it's hypothetical. Supposing you were given the task of having to speak about a chapter from one of the prophets and you didn't have any preparation time whatsoever. It had to happen straight away and you could choose any chapter and you'd have to say roughly what's in it and what does it mean. Uh, and the restriction is that you would have to pick a chapter from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. Now, my guess is that you would probably go for chapter 38. Now, I may be wrong, but that's probably what I would go for. It's because we know Ezekiel 38 so well. We know that from the days of Brother Thomas, when he expounded Ezekiel 38 in Elpis, Israel, how he spoke about Gog, who was to invade the land of Israel and identified Gog as Prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and identified it with the Russia of his days. And how that it would happen when the land of Israel was no longer desolate, but was gathered out of the nations. No people had been there, as far as the Jews were concerned, for many centuries. But according to Bible prophecy, Brother Thomas expounded the fact that they would go back there. They would go back, that there would be a pre-adventual colonization of Palestine before the manifestation of the Son of God. So we know that. We know it so well. And for that reason, I guess that we would be able to, without any preparation, speak to somebody who wanted to know something about that chapter. But what about this verse? And this verse perhaps is a little bit more obscure. So having given you a task which you've been able to accomplish, I guess, in your minds maybe, um, I've got a task now, and what my task is, is to try to make this verse as memorable as some of the other verses that we know so well in Ezekiel chapter 38. So it was the last verse of our reading. And what I'd like to do is to just focus on this verse. That's, that's the purpose. And we'll see in this verse, I hope, that we will be able to identify from the information that is contained in Scripture, information about the mind of modern Russia. That's the purpose of, of this talk, to try to get, to get us to see how God has, in his word, given us so much, so much information, whereby we can identify signs that that day is definitely approaching. So let's look then at this verse, first of all. Thus saith the Lord God, art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time? So that's the title, part of the title of this talk, isn't it? He of whom I have spoken in old time. And from that we should be able to determine the mind of modern Russia. So what does this verse mean? Well, God's saying he's spoken in old time. So we need to date the prophecy of, of Ezekiel. The prophecy of Ezekiel is round about 600 B.C., and so what God is saying, that he's spoken before in old time. So whenever that was, it has to be before 600 BC. He's done it through his servants, the prophets of Israel. And that is in the plural. So it's not just one prophet, it is more than one prophet. And they have prophesied that there would be an invasion of against them. What would that be? Could that be the two parts of the kingdom of Israel, the nation of Israel, and or the tribes of Israel, and the tribe of Judah, and suggest that that might well be the case. So I'd like to just perhaps get us now to open our Bibles with that in mind, and to try to see how God, is, how God could have spoken about this event in old time, prior to the days of um, Ezekiel the prophet. So we want to go to the historical record in the second book of Kings and chapter 17. Now I just want to read a couple of verses from, from this historical record and just to fill in the context of, of uh, 2 Kings 17, it's about the end of the time of the kingdom of Judah. So we can date it and we can date it as at least a hundred years, probably a few more, before the times of Ezekiel. So approximately, we're looking at 700 BC. It's a bit earlier than that, 
and 600 BC. So we'll get an idea that's about 100 years or so in between these two scriptures. So in 2 Kings 17 and verse 22, we read this, For the children of Israel, let's read verse 21 for connection, For he rent Israel from the house of David, and they made Jeroboam the son of Nebat king. And Jeroboam drave Israel from following Yahweh and made them sin a great sin. For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did. They departed not from them. That was something we read yesterday, wasn't it? Until Yahweh removed Israel out of his sight. Now note these. This is, this is our link with Ezekiel 38 verse 17. Until Yahweh removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said by all his servants the prophets, so was Israel carried away out of their own land to Assyria and to this day. So this verse is telling us that God spoke in old time about an invasion. In particular here we're looking at the land of Israel and he did so by his servants the prophets. So let's now keep that thought in mind and let's go to see how God communicates his message to us. And it's useful for us to take a look, therefore, at uh, the prophet Hosea and chapter 12. So if we can take a look at Hosea chapter 12. And we're going to just read one verse. We're going to read one verse in verse 10. Hosea chapter 12 and verse 10. Now this is God explaining how he has communicated his message to us and to to others in bygone times and there are three ways so he says in verse 10 i have also spoken by the prophets so that's the first way that's easy to identify from our reading of scripture isn't it we go to the prophets and there are pronouncements and the prophets say thus saith the lord and we read what message therefore follows that statement so god speaks through his servants, the prophets, and that is one method of communicating. And those words have been recorded for us, those that were deemed necessary for us to know about them in the word of God. So that's the first way. The second way is this, that I have multiplied visions. So that's another way. God gave visions to various people, prophets, kings. He gave visions to to others, and those visions have been a means of communicating his message that he wants man to know about himself and about what he's going to do. And so in the book of Amos, for example, there are visions of Amos, um, which he saw and which God asked him to to describe what he saw. And then God gave the meaning uh, of, of that vision. And there are visions in the book of Daniel, which we are very familiar with, which teach us such a lot about those things which would happen during the times of the Gentiles. And even Isaiah the prophet, it starts off, doesn't it, the vision of Isaiah the son of Amos, uh, the prophet, which he did see. So that's the second one. And the third one is this, and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophet. So three ways, spoken, visions, and similitudes. So what does that mean? Because that's the one that's probably a little bit more difficult for us to get to grips with. What does that actually mean? So let's look at the Hebrew word, and the Hebrew word is dama, D-A-H-M-A-H. Or you might have it spelt differently, um, depending on who's put the concordance together. So the best way we can find out how that, what that word really means is to look at its use in other scripture. And the best place I can take you to is the Song of Solomon. Now, we're going to get to Russia soon, I can tell you. But we're now going to look at the Song of Solomon. We're just in the, setting the basis for all of this. And in the first chapter of the Song of Solomon, and I take the Song of Solomon, the traditional view of the Song of Solomon, which I think it's a wonderful picture of the way in which we have a, a, a vision of Christ and his bride apart and coming together. And yes, there are so many instances in here which we can link back to the times of Solomon. I don't have a problem with any of that. But primarily the message is to see this picture of the the Lord Jesus Christ and his bride coming together. And the groom therefore speaks 
in chapter 1 and verse 9. And what he says is, I have compared thee, O my love, to a company of horses in Pharaoh's chariots. Now, those words, I have compared thee, it's the Hebrew word damar. It's the same word used in Hosea chapter 12 and verse 10. Similitudes. Remember, this is a, a, a primary method of communication by God to his people, to us. And it's similitudes. And what's happening here is the groom is saying, and he's looking at, at, at the company of horses in Pharaoh's chariots, and how majestic they must have looked, and he's comparing his bride to that, that picture. If we go into chapter 2 and verse 9, you see the word it used again. You see it used in verse 9. And this time, it's the bride who's speaking. And she says, in verse 9, My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. And that word like is the same Hebrew word damar. It's exactly the same word. And then, in verse 17, Until the day break and the shadows flee away. So she's looking for this, this day to come. This, this night in which she's been waiting for the time when she will be united with her, with her um, groom. Turn, my beloved, she says, and be thou like, that's the same word again, a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of Betha. And you can imagine a young heart or a roe skipping along the mountains with the, the sure-footedness and, and being galloping, as, as it were, towards, towards a particular place. And, and she sees her groom in that position as coming when he comes that's what it's going to be like an excitement for him and an excitement for her no doubt so this word similitudes then seems to simply mean something like something that's what it simply means so what are we to do in trying to understand this in the context of Ezekiel 38 we are to maybe think about the way in which Assyria behaved of old in the way in which it invaded Israel and in the way in which it invaded Judah and see if we can find similarities between their attitude of mind, their culture, their belief, whatever they did and see if there's a similarity between how they behaved and how Russia is behaving now in our world today and in particular trying to bring everything up to date as much as we possibly can. So that's the task, is to try to, to see if we can make this comparison, this likeness between Assyria of old and Russia. And hopefully that will help us to, to further cement our understanding that we have already in Ezekiel 38, which is pretty strong, isn't it, when you think about the way in which Brother Thomas expounded it and he had no uh, inkling at all at that point politically that things were going to be happening in the Holy Land as they, ha as they were to happen 100 years later from the time in which he wrote Elpis Israel. So we could select maybe no, uh, a number of different Assyrian characteristics. And just before we um, uh, look at, at, at the list that I've got, and there's five to work through, there's one other place I'd like to go, and that is in Isaiah chapter 10. And this actually very much echoes the words that that our brother president um, used in his prayer about the way in which the leaders of the world are moving about doing their own thing but not knowing actually that it's all in the purpose of almighty God to bring everything to a, a point at which he will send his son back to the earth. So in Isaiah chapter 10 and we're going to pick it up in verse 5. So this is now in the days of Hezekiah. So it's of old time in our subject uh, from Ezekiel 38 have not I spoken in old time so it's a hundred years or so before the times of Ezekiel 38 when that was written and verse 5 says O Assyrian the rod of mine anger and the staff in their hand is mine indignation I will send him against an hypocritical nation the hypocritical nation is Israel and Judah in part and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey. Now there's an echo, a clear echo of the situation in Ezekiel 38 that, that is described. Thank you for arranging the English weather for me as well because uh, it makes me feel at home. Uh, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Howbeit he meaneth not so. 
That word meaneth is the same word damar. He doesn't realize that he's being used as like something that was to happen later on and still hasn't happened. Howbeit he meaneth not so, neither doth his heart think so. It is in his heart to destroy and cut off nations, not a few. So as far as the Assyrian was concerned, who happens to be Sennacherib in the days of, of uh, Hezekiah, what, Hez- what Sennacherib was out to do was to capture territory, to make those lands his lands. He was out to capture wealth, to make the wealth of the nations his own wealth. That's exactly what he was up to. He didn't realize that it was God bringing him down as, as, a, as punishment upon the people. He didn't realize that God was using him, using Sennacherib as um, a similitude. He didn't realize that at all. So then, what are we going to just quickly look at with these Assyrian characteristics? The first thing is to consider the military power of Assyria of old, and we might call Russia, of course, the latter-day Assyria. We want to look at the way in which both try to expand their territory. How craft and deceit were features of what they did, how they went about their business. To see how they had total contempt for others. And finally, to just look at the way in which they behaved as autocrats. So then, let's take them one by one, and let's start off with the military power. Now, this book is a book produced by the uh, British Museum, and I've had it some, some years. It's still in print, and what it does is it goes through all the exhibits to do with Assyria and the British Museum, and comments upon them all. And it's a, it's a very interesting book, very useful if you want to try and understand what these things all mean. And it's very, very good to have that. It's not a big book, but it's quite useful. And, um, and it has this, this comment in here. Um, so this is on page 19. I'm just going to read the first paragraph. A casual glance at the Assyrian sculptures in the British Museum suggests that this was a state dedicated wholeheartedly to war. And it's absolutely true. You, you, you go to the British Museum and there are vast amounts of, of um, Assyrian sculptures in the British Museum. You see them, I'll show you a couple of things in a minute, but you just see them there. And it's all about how they captured territory, how they dealt with their captives, how they captured cities, how they went about in their lion hunts for sport, killing lions. It's all about their might, their military might. And if you get a chance to come over to, to uh, Britain, um, best to come in our summertime, and you, will, you must go to the British Museum and see them. And don't just, just, just leave an hour. You need more than that. You need more time than that to take in what is there because it really is worthwhile. This is just one room. This is the, known as the Lakish Room in the British Museum. And it... it depicts the story of uh, Lachish, the siege of Lachish, and the siege of Lachish occurred in the time of Hezekiah. We're going to have a look at 2 Kings 18 a bit later on, um, because that's the timing of the siege of Lachish. And I suppose the, uh, the size of the room, just to give you a bit of a, a measure uh, of what, what, how big it is, I think I would probably about 18 foot maybe, that the bottom end, and then you can work out, if you wanted to count up the tiles, how long it would be. It's, 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 it's big, and this is just one of the things that, that is on uh, as an exhibit in the British Museum. And when you start to look at it, and I don't know how well this is going to come out, probably not too bad, you can see that these artificial lamps, uh, ramps that are being created, that have been built here, to, to uh, go up against the walls of Lakish to conquer and to take the city. And there are the Syrian soldiers with all their armaments and so on on the walls. We look at it in a little bit more detail now. So here's another um, bit of the same, from the same room. The Assyrians with their arrows, uh, bows and arrows, the quiver, the shields and the spears. And, and it's, you know, it's all over the place. It's, it's, uh, and it's not just in that room. It's all over the place. It's not just Sennacherib. It's other kings. And they used these to decorate their palaces so that when people would come, maybe people who were paying tribute or people who would be brought to Assyria, they would see 
they would see these and see the might of old Assyria. Here's another part of the siege. This time the ramp is going in this direction, and this is a, a, an, an engine of war. Um, you can see the wheels just there, and there's a, like a battering ram effectively, and it's protected by these um, uh, archers here. And, and so, um, just get rid of that. So you can see that, that it is, I think, it's fair to say, uh, um, a country dedicated wholeheartedly to war. Now I think when we look at Russia, we, we might think there's a, a real similarity here because every year since 1963, the Russians have held a military parade in Moscow. This is a big event and it happened before 1963, but I'm using 1963 because consistently, each year since then, they have held this parade. And it commemorates the victory that uh, Russia had over Nazi Germany in the Second World War. And what you get is, and you can, you can watch this on YouTube, you'll see the, uh, the armoured vehicles, the rockets, you'll see... Um, the, the soldiers singing and, and marching before the president and any of his guests, the tanks that roll by, and also, of course, there's the fly past, and, and it's a real big event. And these pictures are taken from the 2017 parade. Um, I watched the 2018 parade on YouTube, and it takes about an hour and a half for all this kind of thing to happen. But it's a real big event. It's a show of the military might of modern Russia. And you've got even a guide to, t to tell you what all these things are, what, what are they called, and so on. And no doubt their capability. Now, when we put that description alongside what we've just seen with Russia, I would suggest to you that viewing the Russian military parades also suggests that this is a state dedicated wholeheartedly to war. Their military might has been built up significantly in the last few years. So there's one similitude, that's one similarity, there's one likeness. Now what about the way in which they expand their territory? Now this is a, a map of the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrian Empire under Isa Haddon, one of the Assyrian kings. But this particular Assyrian king uh, is after Sennacherib. He's actually one of his sons. He's not one of the two sons that killed him. You remember Sennacherib, after the defeat of the Assyrian army at the time of Hezekiah, goes back to Assyria, and his sons later kill him, two of his sons. This is a son, but it's not the one that, that killed him. And, and you've got the extent of the empire and uh, Esarhaddon. But what we have here is a, a little tiny piece of, of land, which is Judah, and in particular Jerusalem, which they never took. They never conquered that. And that's because of the way in which Hezekiah got the people to trust in the Lord their God. And that was, of course, prophesied. You may recall that in Isaiah chapter 8, the invasion of Assyria is described like a river overflowing its banks. And when a river overflows its banks, then there's a flood of the land. And so as Assyria went forward to expand its territory, it flooded these lands. But it wasn't going to flood Judah because the prophet Isaiah said that he shall reach even to the neck. And so their head, the principal part as far as God is concerned of his land, was Jerusalem. And, and therefore the flow of waters only went up to the neck. They never went over the head of, uh, of the kingdom of, of Judah. So that's the extent of the Syrian empire. And the Bible tells us that there were waves of Assyrian invasions against Israel and against Judah, and each time tribute was paid to the Assyrian kings. Now I've listed there four, three of which are in scripture, that's the last three. The top one, Jehu to Shalmaneser III, is not in, recorded in scripture, but it is uh, in the black obelisk, again, in the British Museum, and Jehu is seen paying tribute to Shalmaneser III. There's also uh, invasions to of of the land of Judah, and we've got those. And all of those, apart from that one there, all of these are recorded in Scripture. So there's a number of waves of Assyrian invasion and tribute being paid to the Assyrian kings. 
So we need to understand a little bit more about Assyrian history. And in this other book, I'm recommending you two books now. This is Ancient Iraq. Um, it covers the Assyrian Empire because Iraq, uh, also the, it would look at the Babylonian Empire, would look at earlier empires. So it doesn't just cover Assyria, but it is quite interesting. And you have to realize that Assyria got to a, a particular height of its power, and then it went into decline, only to rise to power again. And this book records that, and it tells us that for 36 years, and gives us the dates of 781 to 745 BC, Assyria was practically paralyzed. For several years, there was no king in the country. Now, just think of Jonah for a moment as a complete aside, but it's useful to have this bit of information. Jonah was asked to go to Assyria, and when he eventually did go to Assyria, and said, in 40 days Nineveh shall be overthrown, it was the king that took action from the king downwards and caused the whole nation to repent, and therefore the judgment upon Nineveh was deferred. It didn't take place at all in that time. And Jesus comments on that, doesn't he, that the men of Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonas. Now, what's interesting then is, after that period of decline, this man here, Tiglath Pileser was the rebuilder of the Assyrian Empire. And he rebuilt this empire, made it great again, and then other kings uh, ha ha uh, uh, followed on from him, continuing the expansion of the Assyrian Empire. So let's think about that and those facts in relation to modern day Russia. So we're going back to 1922, which is hardly modern day, but we need to start there because that's when, soon after the First World War, we had a change in the uh, politics of Russia. And there was a formation of the Soviet Union on the 29th of December 1922. And you may see, well, what are these things here? These are the six languages of the six states which formed the original Soviet Union way back in 1922. And this massive hammer and sickle, which is the symbol of their empire and the symbol of communism, is, is really big, isn't it, on the world. And that was what they wanted to do. They wanted to expand their political philosophy. They wanted to expand communism. They wanted to take over, if possible, the whole world and, and use their economic model as something that, that would embrace the whole world. They thought politically that that was the, the right thing to do. And so their aim was really world domination. Now, to some extent, they, um, they succeeded in part in the sense that they did expand from six territories, six states, to what was 15. So here we've got the 15 uh, listed there. And now you can see there are different bands, and there are 15 different bands, again, with the languages of all the states uh, that formed the Soviet Union. But it was dissolved on the 26th of December 1991. Economically, communism just didn't work, doesn't work. And not only that, the Eastern communist countries, who were allies of Russia, also <coughs> communism fell in, in Europe, in Eastern Europe at the time. So it was dissolved on the 26th of December 1991. Prior to its dissolution, of course, it fell into decline. It fell into serious decline. And there's a, there's a mirror image, almost, of what happened in Assyria. It got reached a pretty good high power in the 60s, and, and maybe beyond that. Uh, it was one of the two great world powers, and then it went into serious decline, and it was dissolved. And it wasn't until Putin comes to power, round about 2000, and he starts to rebuild it. He's, he's the modern-day Tiglat Pileser, who rebuilds Russia. But you can see that this symbol, which was used at the time up to 1991, still has its aim as world domination, as, as a, its aim as expanding communism. And, and there is a practical benefit for your own people of doing that. 
which is why the Assyrians wish to expand their territory. If you want to keep your own people safe, and you've got a state, if you conquer the state next to you, and, and on that border, and maybe on that border, um, and then you, you may have your enemies further afield, in order for them to try and contact you, they've got to go through the territory that you've already con conquered. So you have a buffer between your enemies and your own people, and that's the buffer state. And Assyria would work on that kind of principle, as no doubt did Russia, and Russia is still working on that principle, as we shall see a little bit later on. So I'm going to show you now how, Assyria, how, how Russia is trying to expand its territory. So we're going to look at this little country here, five, which is Georgia. And we'll also be looking at um, Moldova, which is number 10, which is this little bit here. Um, and we'll also look at Ukraine as well. So we'll, we'll briefly cover those things. Now, this is um, the first territory, former Soviet Republic of Georgia. And if you make out the map, it's, it's really that border along the top, including the green and the, the, the pinky colour, and, and up here, and that is Georgia. So that was the country of Georgia at the time of the dissolution of the Soviet uh, Union in 1991. Now, since then, what has happened in that territory is interesting because President Putin is seeking to continue to expand his empire, to try to take back some of the countries that became disassociated with Russia um, in 1991. And so there are two areas. One here is called South Ossetia, and this one is called Abkhazia. And there was Russian influence in both places, massive Russian influence, because there are lots of Russian speakers in those two areas. And the Georgians didn't like Russian troops being in their territory, and so in 2008 they uh, invaded South Ossetia to get rid of the Russians. Well, the response of the Russians was to pour thousands of troops into South Ossetia within five weeks, defeat the Georgians, and then, within a couple of weeks after that, the president of Russia at the time, which was Medvedev, he signed decrees recognizing the independence of these two areas because Russians were in this area too. And, and so they said, right, we're going to pour these part of, um, uh, of a link with Russia, and they are sovereign states in their own right. Georgia doesn't recognize it. Most countries don't recognize it. But um, Syria recognized it, surprisingly, uh, this year. And you can almost picture President Putin nudging uh, uh, Assad, saying, look, you know, can't you recognize this? All I've done for you and keeping you going in your country. And, and so the Syrian foreign ministry, they, they recognized these two, these two um, parts of Georgia as independent republics. And the, the comment is, from Georgia, it's a blatant violation of international law. And what that means to Russia, I don't know. But um, there's a couple of other prop, uh, uh, countries now. When I was... Um, thinking about this before I came over and, and thinking about signs of the times, I decided to do an exhortation in, uh, at, at a, a, a ecclesia I was speaking, and I thought I would try to encourage them with the signs of the times and talk about the way in which Russia was seeking to expand its territories. What I didn't know was, in the audience, there was a sister from Moldova, and she told me a few things that I'll mention a little bit later on. Um, but in particular, this, there's this area here, which I didn't know about at the time, Transnistria, which is predominantly Russian-speaking. And again, Russians are there in that part of Moldova. <coughs> so just keep that on one side. There's also then Ukraine. Now, more startling things have happened in Ukraine. The whole territory of Ukraine is everything that you see there uh, without this sort of buff color. So it's everything there, but it's in different colors. It's in different colors because the blue represents... Ukrainians who predominantly speak Ukrainian. The, the pink is where Russian and Ukrainian is spoken, probably in about equal measure. And Crimea here, which has been hitting the news lately, and this part of eastern Ukraine, predominantly Russian speakers. And as far as President Putin is concerned, 
if you could speak Russian, then you're Russian. And he's been, therefore, he was able to go into Crimea and he was able to take Crimea. And there are Russian troops also in eastern Ukraine. Now, this is all um, quite interesting because in 1994, there was an agreement. After the breakup of the Soviet Union, there were nuclear weapons in Ukraine. Uh, the Russians didn't really want them to still be in Ukraine, so there was a, 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 a treaty signed. And this was signed by uh, a number of countries, as you will see. And I'm just going to read one uh, sentence to you, which will give you the picture. So this is an agreement, United Nations, okay? And it says, the Russian Federation, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and the United States of America reaffirm their commitment to Ukraine in accordance with the principles of the final act of the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe to respect, getting to the point, the independence and sovereignty and the existing borders of Ukraine. Russia signed this along with those others and they've gone in subsequently into Crimea and they've annexed Crimea um, as part of their territory. And commentators, political tom commentators, say that the non-violent takeover of Crimea by the Russian forces were an, was an unprecedented event in the history of post-war Europe. There are the dates on when Crimea was annexed, and eastern Ukraine is still a problem. It's not been annexed yet, but there are lots of Russian speakers there, lots of supporters of Russia, but uh, and Ukraine on the other side is, is not in uh, an agreement with what Russia is doing, but there are lots of troops there, and we wonder what's going to happen next. And this is kind of a really important buffer state, isn't it, for President Putin, because Ukraine was leaning towards membership of the European community, leaning towards membership of NATO, and he doesn't want that to happen at all. Now, we move on now to look at craft and deceit as our third point, and this is where we kind of realize how he's able to get away with so much, how Putin is able to get away with the things that he does. And we can add to that lies, treacherous, treachery, and dishonesty. Now, this is the Sennacherib's prism, also in the British Museum. I hope I'm whetting your appetite for, for a visit to, to, um, to the old country. Um, and on this prism, second act, Sennacherib records... <coughs> His, his invasion of uh, Judah um, and says that 46 of his fortified cities were taken. How many people he took off captive? And it doesn't say, of course, what happened next. And what happened next was that the Assyrian army was defeated by the angel of God on that famous night when uh, Hezekiah and his people were besieged in Jerusalem. And in a way, it's a little bit of a deception, isn't it? To boast about what you did, but not actually give the full picture. Uh, fortunately, we don't have to rely on that information for interpreting history. We can rely on God's word to give us what happened historically. And Nahum, who prophesies against uh, Nineveh, um, may, makes this point. There is one come out of thee that imagineth evil against Yahweh, a wicked counsellor. And who is this? Let's go to 2 Kings 18 now and look at a couple of those verses because this is the time of Hezekiah. We're going to see what Hezekiah did. Uncharacteristically, Hezekiah did something here. In verse 13 of 2 Kings 18, it says there that in the 14th year of King Hezekiah did Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, come up against all the fenced cities of Judah and took them. Now, your king in Jerusalem you're really going to be concerned about all this. You know that God is great, that God will protect you, but at the same time, you see this invasion coming down and down and down in the country, and all the lands are being taken, and you wonder if it's going to happen possibly to you and to the people in Jerusalem. So verse 14 says that Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria to Lachish. So Lachish, the Lachish room... We've already looked at the Bibles alive when you go to the British Museum. Uh, and saying, I have offended, return from me. That which thou puttest on me will I bear. And the king of Assyria pointed unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver, etc., etc. So Hezekiah pays lots of money 
to the king of Assyria for the sole purpose of stopping the invasion where it was. Don't come any further. That's basically what it was doing. Paying him the money and getting him to stop. But look what happened in verse 17. As soon as all this was done, this is the same year, and the king of Assyria sent Tartan and Rabsaris and Rabshakeh from Lachish to King Hezekiah with a great host against Jerusalem. And they went up. And the scripture records the speech of, of Rabshakeh, where he spoke in the Jews' language, so the Jews on the wall could hear everything that was being said, and how he tried to get them to surrender to, the king, uh, to king Sennacherib. He said in verse 23, I pray thee, give pledges to my lord, the king of Assyria, and I will deliver thee 2,000 horses, if thou be able on thy part to set riders upon them. In a kind of sarcastic way. I'll give you 2,000 horses. I'm surprised if you're going to have enough people to ride them, but I would give them to you if you had them. And then he says in verse 30, verse 29, let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in Yahweh, saying, Yahweh will surely deliver us, and this city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Syria. And then he says, Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present, and come out to me, and then eat ye every man out of his own vine, and every one out of his own fig tree, and drink ye the waters. Drink ye every one the waters of his own cistern. And he goes on to say, I'll take you to a land just like yours. You'll be fine. You just surrender to me. Now, he's using all sorts of means of lies, I would believe. They don't normally treat their captives in a good way, the Assyrians. Uh, you, can, you can see how they treated their captives on there, and we'll see them in a minute. Uh, and this is what he's trying to do, persuade the people not to trust in God. It was a dishonest speech, wasn't it? This was the Assyria of old. This was the way in which they operated. This is how they tried to manipulate thinking and, and their people. And so Isaiah prophesies of this and says, Woe, unto, woe to thee that spoilest, and thou wast not spoiled. So nobody went over to Assyria and took their territory. Nobody did that, but they went to spoil other people's territory and deal us treacherously, and they dealt not treacherously with thee. Hezekiah, in buying him off, didn't expect this next invasion. But of course, Hezekiah then realized his mistake and trusted in the Lord his God and was saved because of his trust. So how does Russia then pursue its various policies? Well, um, it can pursue them by... Pass, what, one thing that it does is called passportization. It's a systematic distribution of passports to Russian-speaking people in former Soviet republics. And it's clear then that if the people are Russian, Putin believes that they, have, they are speaking Russian, Putin believes that they are Russian, gives them a Russian passport, and then feels he has the right to protect their interests. That's one way. Control of the mass media. Sister from Moldova that spoke to me after my exhortation said to me that um, the, the, the television programs in Moldova are, are not good for the Moldovan television channels. People watch Russian television. And if you watch Russian television, you will watch Russian news, you will get Russian propaganda, you will become thinking like the Russians. And you can see how this kind of thing will influence people. When Russia went into Crimea, it went in with troops without any indications that they were Russian troops at all. We all knew they were Russian troops, but there was no indication that they were Russian troops. They went in as anonymous soldiers, and they abused their privilege on the United Nations Security Council, again, which I'll come on to in a minute, and they flood the media with misinformation denials and lies, and there's been accusations of the way in which they have intervened in elections in the West. They also use this. Now, in the Balkan War in the 90s, Yugoslavia broke up, there was civil war, and uh, it broke up into various republics, and this territory here of Kosovo was part of Serbia. But because the way in which um, a lot of them are not ethnic Serbians, they some come from Albania and um, 
the Kosovans, and and the um, they were not treated too well by the Serbians, and so they declared independence. And this was recognised by the West. And it's also recognised by 111 out of 103 states who are members of the United Nations. And so what's um, Putin going to do about this? Well, he's going to say, well, I just did the same in Crimea. There was a, a, an independent country formed just unilaterally. Um, we did the same in Crimea. What's the big deal? And he cites the Kosovo precedent. So the West has created a bit of a problem for itself in quickly recognizing the Republic of Kosovo. And this is what he does. He will use anything. They have contempt for others. The Assyrians had terrible contempt for us in the way they didn't regard human life as of any value at all. If people got in the way, they just got them out of the way. And so there's some pretty horrific scenes there, and there's many worse that you can see in, in the British Museum. I won't go into that now, because it's not particularly nice. But um, there again, they, they're saying that the worst treatment was reserved for those who have previously accepted the Assyrian rule, and then they turned their back on it at all. So if Hezekiah, if Jerusalem had have gone into captivity, and if, it, if its walls had have been breached, if God hadn't have intervened, then the people of Jerusalem would have suffered greatly. But God did intervene. This is the chamber of the United Nations Security Council in, in New York. And it's where lots of important decisions are made. There are 15 members of the Security Council. There are five permanent members, China, Britain, uh, France, Russia, and the United States. They have the power of veto. And then there are 10 other members who serve for two, two years, and then they get replaced by another member state. And Russia is able to use its veto to block anything that it doesn't like happening in the United Nations Security Council. And so when they had problems in Syria using <laughs> chemical weapons. I, I can't spend too long on this because my time is, is going very fast, so I'm going to have to be quick now. But this is the 12th time, This is remember, in April this year, 12th time that Russia used its veto power at the Council to block action targeting Syria because it uses Syria as an ally. It has an air base and a naval base in Syria which um, they've been granted the naval base for 49 years, and thereafter, they can extend that for 25 years. So, so they're there in Syria. And Syria, of course, is the territory of the King of the North. At least, it definitely is. There's other parts of the territory, yes. But absolutely, Syria is in the territory of the King of the North. And Russia is there permanently now, as far as we can see. Uh, this again was uh, a, a particular debate going back to the use of the nerve agent in one of the towns in, in England, in Salisbury, um, and uh, various comments there. Again, I haven't time now to say that. Time seems to be racing away. But this is significant. This is the British Prime Minister, Theresa May, making a statement. And looking at, uh, again, this was made this year, and she's basically saying Russia promised to let Syria, to, to get chemical weapons out of Syria. And it clearly hasn't done that because they've used them again in 2018. Uh, and, and she's pointing that out and she made that in, important statement earlier on this year. So Russia has complete contempt for the way in which the rebels in Syria are being gassed by President Assad and his regime. Complete contempt. Doesn't matter to them because they want to be in Syria and they want to keep Assad in power. Autocratic. They are incredibly autocratic. The Syrian kings, we've got a couple of depictions there of Sennacherib and Tiglath Pileser, the third, and, and you wouldn't want to cross any of these. No way would you want to cross them. After the Russian Revolution, the Russian leaders behaved the same. Stalin emerged as one of those who got rid of all opposition and ruled for many, many years. And we're seeing now a new face, new face from the beginning of this century, uh, President Putin. These pictures are 10 years apart. This magazine here, Time magazine, was in November 2007, and this is uh, The Economist of, of November 2017. And both have the same 
headline here. You might not be able to read out the back, but it says a czar is born, and the, uh, again, a czar is born. Putin dressed up um, in czar, a czarist um, regalia. He became prime minister almost out of nowhere in 1999. So Yeltsin was the president, he was ill, and then he became president and won a second term. And so this presidency lasted two terms, which was four years each term. He wasn't allowed under the Russian constitution to, to stand again. So his friend Medvedev here, he took the role of president during this period and Putin was prime minister. And nobody knows really who is properly in charge there. But it's described as a Putin Medvedev tan democracy. Um, and, and so then during that period of time, the Russian constitution was changed so that the period of occupying the role of president was extended from four years to six years. And so Putin applies again, he gets in again. And then recently he's been voted in again, yet again. He is quite popular in lots of parts of Russia, not extensively, but certainly in lots of parts of Russia because he has rebuilt Russia from the terrible state it was in up into the state it's in now. And he's there now until May 2024. Now, is he the Gog of Ezekiel 38? That's the question that we'd all like to know the answer to. And we can't really give a proper answer to that, can we? A definite answer. All we can say is that he does fit the bill. He very much fits the bill of the autocratic Assyrian king who, who has rebuilt the empire, who is happy to take more territory. It's clear similitude of the one of whom God sp had spoke of old time and then later on spoke of the one who would come against the land. What is interesting is that this year in the military parade, standing next to Putin, sitting by him, watching all the uh, armies go past him, was Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel. And I couldn't help thinking, as I was looking at all of this, that what's he doing there? Is he really falling for the same kind of trap that maybe Hezekiah started to fall for in cozying up to Russia? He, he was watching the very rockets, the very troops, the very tanks that could well be those that will come down like a storm upon the land of Israel, as Ezekiel describes in chapter 38. So he goes and he lays uh, some flowers on the tomb of the unknown soldier. And there is this verse, isn't there, in Isaiah chapter 10, that chapter which de dealt with the Assyrians, um, that there will come a time when Israel, if it does, start to trust in Russia for its security. And just this week there has been headlines just talking about the Russians um, guaranteeing the security of Israel on the Syrian border. That's, that's really significant, isn't it? It's already got peace with Egypt and with Jordan. And if it's guaranteed security in Syria, then there's not much else. Lebanon, the Palestinians, yeah, there's a few problems to sort out. But can you see it all being pieced together, all coming together? And there will be a time when the house of Judah, those who escape, the remnant, a small number that escape, shall no more again stay upon him that smote them, but they shall stay upon Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. Now, I'd just like to finish, brothers and sisters, very quickly with some, uh, just a tiny little similitude in the second book of Kings and chapter 8. Because if I can exhort you to do one thing, and that is to look for these things in the word of God, because they're so interesting and so exciting. Now, very quickly, 2 Kings 8 tells us about the time when Elisha visits again the woman of Shunem, which we have recorded in chapter 4, the one whose son he raised to life. And Elisha goes to her and says in verse 1, Arise and go thou and thine household and sojourn wheresoever thou canst sojourn, for Yahweh hath called for a famine, and it shall come also upon the land for seven years. And the woman arose and did after the saying of the man of God, and she went with her household and sojourned in the land of the Philistines seven years. So she listened to the words of the prophets. 
God wants us to listen to the words of the prophets. She listened to Elisha, one of the prophets, and did what he said. And then in that time, when she was away from her own house, away from her own lands, she was counting the days, no doubt. As we count the days, in our hymn it says, as a woman counts the days. And it came to pass at the seven years' end that the woman returned out of the land of the Philistines and she went forth to cry unto the king for her house and for her land. She wanted her inheritance. She didn't have it for that long period of seven years, which seven times, 2,520 years, probably that's linked to the 2,520 years of Daniel. The same kind of time period. It's significant that the, word, that the number seven is being used. She sojourns in the land of Philistines seven years. She goes to cry to the king for her inheritance. And God does the rest, doesn't he? Because the very time she goes, she's in the right place at the right time. And she cries to the king. And who's there? Gehazi is there, the servant of Elisha. And he's talking about the very act of Elisha restoring to life her son. And he says in verse 5, at the end of the verse, My Lord, O King, this is the woman, and this is her son whom Elisha restored to life. And look what the king says. Restore all that was hers, in verse 6, and all the fruits of the field since the day that she left the land, even until now. So, my dear brothers and sisters, as we contemplate that, we think of ourselves who in this night of Gentile darkness are counting the days until that time comes, that day appointed when the Lord Jesus Christ will return to the earth. And we want that inheritance in the land of promise. It's promised to us, to Abraham and to his seed. And if we are Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We want the promise. But in order to get it, we need to do as she did. Listen to the words of the prophets and God will do the rest.